Today we are going to study file system interface. Uh, let us check from the audio schedule. Here you can see that we studied memory management and virtual memory in the past uh, weeks on the ODL method. Okay, today we are going to study file system interface on chapter 11 of the textbook. So this is an interesting topic and easy at the same time because uh, file systems are something that everybody use uh, in their daily computing task. Let me share the textbook with you. Okay. So this is a Shilpa Chats uh, Dragon textbook. So I have highlighted few terms um, with the yellow highlighter um, in the chapter. Although the chapter is important, you can read it thoroughly. Okay, the writer says the file system consists of two distinct parts. One, a collection of files, each storing related data. Two, a directory structure which organizes and provides information about all the files in the system. So just like previous chapter, uh, in this chapter also, we will discuss about different views of uh, the information or data stored on your storage devices, like hard drive or secondary storage. I hope you remember, student K, we studied uh, that there is a CPU view of a memory address. That address was called logical. And there was a kernel view that was uh, resolved through memory management unit or the XMM. And there was a physical address that is the memory view or main memory view. So there are different views. Similarly, files may be on different views go. This may study cutting it. This may be a hard drive ka view. This may be a space that is divided in mein divided hai, of fixed size like 512k or 1024k, etc. But we have to be concerned because the physical storage device is controlled by the hardware abstraction layer, which contains a device driver of that particular device, storage device. We are concerned with the kernel view. Uh, you know, kernel interacts with the hardware abstraction layer. And it abstracts a logical view of the data stored on your hard drive. Here we can see file concept definition. The operating system provides a uniform logical view. This is the first important term, uniform logical view of stored information. Operating system abstracts from the physical properties of storage devices to define a logical storage unit called the file. So basically, the task of the operating system or the kernel view is that it develops a uniform logical view over the storage devices, physical storage devices or over the hardware abstraction layer. It forms a logical view <clears throat> that is uniform as well. For example, you have a media file, a movie that is stored on 50 different sectors on your hard drive, for example. Now, and they are not contiguous, they are spread across the hard drive. Now, if you want to play that file in your media player or VLC player, the file plays seamlessly and you are not unaware of the fact that the file is distributed into 50 chunks. So how is that possible? That's the task of your operating system, that it provides a uniform logical view. So you fi see file as a coherent single atomic unit that is uniform as well as contiguous in your perception. So a file is basically a logical storage unit maintained by operating system as a uniform logical view. A simpler definition of file is defined here by the writer. A file is a named collection of related information that is recorded on secondary storage. Now you can see a name is bound to relevant or related information that are stored on your secondary storage. So file is basically a name. And when I say name, it means there must be a file number, a file identifier. 
stored in some table like file allocation table by which operating system can recognize different files uh, uniquely. So a file is a name here you may add or a number for collection of related information that is stored in secondary storage. So this is a very simple definition. Here it has described the types of files like text, source or executable. As I have told you from the first lecture that this textbook is used for engineers as well as other disciplines like electrical, mechanical and other students of different disciplines also study this textbook. Therefore, every chapter of this textbook also contains very basic information. So you may go through quickly from that information which you already know. OK, so after the definition of the file, every file have some attributes like name of the file, file identifier, which I've just discussed with you, a unique tag. Like the students, you have started in programming that every process has a has an edge instance. That edge instance or the PID in the formal name process ID. So every process have a unique process ID by which you can uh, separately identify that process. So similarly, every file have a unique identifier that is stored, stored into the file allocation table. So files have types definitely source, executable, batch and others. Uh, and file will be stored, stored on a logical location. Now, whenever we talk about the location, we are referring to the logical view. That's the start of the chapter that we are concerned with the uniform logical view developed above the physical storage devices as a logical storage unit called file. So we won't be referring to the uh, hardware itself, the sectors and blocks. We will be referring to the logical view that is maintained by the kernel. So every file have size, you know, uh, it depends from operating system to operating system that how they compute size, whether in bytes or words or blocks or any other scheme, the unit they use. Usually bytes are used in most operating systems, but it's not limited to that because it's a logical view and you can compute in any form you like according to the nature and requirement of the operating system. So also there are time, date and user identification in a file. You can just click any file. Let me show you if it will become much easier for you. If I'm going to share with you, suppose this is the ordeal plan file and if we go to the properties and we go to the details, you see name, type, folder path, size, date created, etc, etc. As well as read only hidden. So there are, these are, the details are the attributes, whereas read only, etc., is the access right which we will discuss later in this chapter. So, going back to the book, so you have studied these in the past as, as well, and you are daily interact with the file system one way or the other. I hope you have might have programmed files, find your text, ask I files in your. Uh, programming fundamental course or the data structure course. Uh, definitely you might have a little interaction with the file system. So this figure is showing the Mac OS uh, file attributes. They are the same with different uh, titles. OK, some operating system have extended file attributes. Some have less attributes. It depends on from operating system to operating system. OK, so this figure illustrates file information window of Mac OS X. The information about all files is kept in the directory structure. Now, the data related or relevant data is bound to a file number or a file name, and files are bound to a directory structure. I mean, a directory name, one directory may contain a lot of files, and directories are bound to a volume, a partition. So, hard drive at the top, your disk, a disk is partitioned into multiple volumes volumes uh, let me show you from the device manager so that it becomes a bit easier to understand if i have not opened the device manager let me open it so from uh, you may click uh, 
manage from my computer or computer and you will see the computer management console where you can click the disk management let me share it with you so dear students here you can see we are in computer management and we go to disk management straight away and you see that i have two disks on my computer disk zero and disk one this is the topmost hierarchy and then the logical hierarchy is split into partitions partitions or volumes you see there is on disk zero there are two partition one is system reserved and the second is c drive on disk one you may see that there are four partitions one is system reserved and p e and f are win 10 backup and bit locker locked other drives so first the disk comes then under that the disk is divided into volumes these partitions may be regarded as volume as well uh, like you just click properties and you will see volume system reserve so this partition is also called volume and you can see here it is using the word partition primary partition all are primary basically there is no secondary partition in, in, the, in these two drives okay also i would like to notice one more thing here that on disk 0 c drive win 7 partition is mounted with letter c whereas the system reserved is not mounted which means that the system reserved will not be shown into my computer as you can see uh, here in disk 1 this system reserved is also not mounted b e and f drives are mounted let me show you from my computer as well so i share my computer with you here you see that you can see win 10 c d e f four drives are mounted win 7 win 10 backup and bit locker lock now we check we go back to the disk uh, manager and I will unmount a drive called Windows 10 Here you see that you may click change drive letter and path and you and once it is removed now the volume although exist in logical view however it is not available for read write in other words it is not mounted so now we go back to my computer and let me show you that as you can see the drive d uh, labeled win 10 is gone because that drive is unmounted so when you mount a drive it is shown in your my computer and when you unmount a drive it is not available for read and write so let's go back to disk manager and again we right click it and we click change drive letter and path and we click add and then it is mounted with uh, letter D and when now we go back to my computer and we see that we will refresh my computer and now you see that win 10 is now available the drive win 10 or partition or volume win 10 is mounted with letter D again in my computer so we go back to the textbook after looking these uh, okay we go back to my computer so we have completed two hierarchy one was disk zero disk one the uh, uppermost is a disk then the disk is partitioned in volumes or partitions and then that uh, partition is further divided into directories now you can see these are a lot of directories here and these directories are further divided into subdirectories or file okay so this is the hierarchy table and we daily use these systems um, and everybody interacts with directory and files on your cell phone or on your computer going back to the textbook now so now uh, it is very clear to us that the information about all files is kept in the directory structure so one directory may hold several files and a file contains several information or data 
Typically, a directory entry consists of the file names and its unique identifier. Although we are not seeing the file numbers, but that are relevant to the uh, operating system to maintain file allocation tables. So what operations can be performed on files? You all know what sort of operations we may perform in journal life as well as in programming. Uh, you can create a file. You can write the file you just created and uh, you may read a file and you may seek different information in the file like you're playing a media player file and you are on uh, time two minutes and you go to time 10 minutes then the uh, the pointer will seek information that are stored at uh, time uh, tag on 10 minutes you may delete a file you may truncate a file as well now even if you have not programmed files in previous courses although it is highly unlikely that during data structures and uh, programming fundamentals and object oriented programming you might have uh, at least uh, interacted with one sort of file either binary or ascii or uh, maybe even some students have uh, programmed unicode files as well even if you have not programmed then you guys know that in windows programming whenever you try to interact with a resource when I talk resource I mean data you need a pointer to do that you know when we try to execute our process or window what we do first we call create window and as a return we get the H wind pointer address pointer with H wind we may access the resources from the root process or from the kernel similarly students I hope you remember K when we try to paint our window by using begin paint or get DC uh, then we have the HDC as a return value from the function we get the handle to the device context similarly when we try to use text matrix we have to uh, create an instance and we send the NTM parameter or in the message structure we send the and msg structure so we always need a pointer to that structure which we send to the define proper values similarly file is a resource every resource you want to work on with you must have a pointer like uh, in previous courses like in data structures you cannot create a linked list without a pointer an array is a resource and the integer pointer to that array is its index so even in array you use a pointer in link list you use a pointer in for painting you use a pointer HTC for uh, resource request uh, through postman you use uh, in wind proc you use hwind so for every resource for message loop you use and msg for text matrix you use the address of the text matrix structure so for every resource to work on or performing actions on a resource requires a pointer by which we may point to that resource because if we can't point to a resource we can't use that resource therefore files are resources as well we need a pointer to perform operations on the file okay so whenever you have to write a file you need a write pointer when you have to read a file you may call that pointer as a read pointer and you may reposition that uh, pointer as well which is called seek okay so these are the basic operations on a file most of the file operations mentioned involve searching the directory for the entry associated okay let me tell you that uh, in the re remainder of this chapter the writer has uh, often reference to solaris and unix earlier versions of Unix and Solaris operating system and only one figure I think is from the Microsoft Windows that shows the access rights. All other uh, examples are from Solaris and Unix. I'll be um, giving Windows examples with reference to our experience of uh, Windows kernel programming. Here you see it has written named file. A file is named if it has an ASCII identifier. But if a file exists, it, it must have a file identifier number. The file identification number is mandatory for a file. Whenever a file is created, like whenever a process is created, the edge instance is created on the program entry point. And this is the process identification number or PID stored in the process table of the operating system. 
similarly when a file is create, created a file identifier that uniquely identifies the file uh, to the operating system is created okay so a file which don't have an ascii or unicode name but has a file identifier is called a named file a named files are not covered in this chapter therefore we won't explore these however named files uh, here give the definition most of the file operations mentioned involve searching the directory for the entry associated with the named file so when you have to perform an operation on the file you have to search that with its name uh, okay so operating system now it is talking about solaris but that is also true for microsoft windows or unix with different names the operating system keeps a table called the open file table the there is a table that is stored on the secondary storage of all the files in the system and when the files are opened now you have uh, a file table open file table in the either in the main memory or in the swap file that contains the file ids of all files which are opened okay for uh, creating a file you may call the create function in the solaris for deleting you may call delete for open you may call the open system call okay the implementation of open and close operation is more complicated now it is the writer is talking about concurrency concurrent processes when more than one process required to access a file simultaneously then there is a complication in open and close now how the reliability of the file will be maintained that is maintained through different uh, methods the method discussed in this textbook is about the file semantics in which we can create certain semantic rules to ensure the reliability of the file that is discussed in the end of this chapter which we will cover today inshallah now here uh, you see that uh, for uh, concurrent process access it talked about two tables the operating system uses two level of internal tables although names are different in different operating systems but more or less all operating systems uh, conventional operating systems maintain these two tables a per process table for files and a system wide table so there are two tables in every operating system the process table tracks all files that a process has opened the process table file is per process table file is local to the process it is the process view it is the i am again repeating it is the process of the files uh, local to a process uh, so it may be different for outside world like operating system have different um, file ids for uh, files available uh, currently to different processes and every process may have its own identification data in its table so there are two tables we see one by one these two tables each entry in the per process table in turn points to a system wide open file table so from this definition it will become clear to you that the per process table entry is binded to the system wide open file table and the system wide uh, table contains the interaction with the hardware abstraction layer or the or uh, the data on the disk actually stored stored the system wide table contains process independent information so the process per process table id is different than the system may be different than the system wide table and the system wide table interacts with the uh, hall hardware restriction layer for storing and accessing data on the actual drive so every process uh, maintains a per process table for files it has open and a system maintains a system wide a uh, wide uh, file uh, table for the um, files that are open in the system so every operating system have these two now one solution to the concurrency which it mentioned earlier in this paragraph states here typically the open file table also has an open count associated with each file to indicate how many processes have the file open it means that uh, whenever a per process table request the system wide table to bind its process with the 
file stored on the drive, the counter will be incremented by one. And whenever a process indicates that uh, it, it do not require binding anymore or delete the local identifier, then the count is decreased by one. So this is basically the counter. Every file have a counter associated with the file identifier that shows that how many concurrent processes are accessing that file. So the open file table also has an open count associated with each file to indicate how many processes have the file open. Each close decreases this open count when the open count reaches zero. Although this close and open function will not be identical throughout the operating systems like Mac, Android, Solaris, OS slash 2, DOS, Windows, but there will be some functions that will be used. So I am experiencing a little bit network, uh, bad network quality here. So it's used for the jitters. Okay, so this way the the system wide table is updated with the counter. Okay, when a file is open, several pieces of information are associated with the file, like file pointer, file open count, disk location of the file that is maintained with, uh, with the device driver available in the hardware abstraction layer, and access rights. Access rights mean who can read, who can write, either file is hidden from some user or viewed to all. These are access rights of file when a file is open. So these parameters are set. The list is not exhaustive. They have presented the list as an example. So here again, uh, they shared uh, an example from the Solaris that a shared lock is, a, is like a reader lock in that several processes can acquire the file concurrently but can't change it, which means that you have broadcasted a file. A shared lock means uh, that you have shared the file with a lot of users, concurrent users, however, they can't change it. An exclusive lock term is used when a certain process is given the permission to write. So the file becomes write lock and it can't be acquired by other processes for that same purpose. OK, it has given a Java example, which we won't be looking because uh, you might have done files earlier. So, okay. Furthermore, operating systems may provide either mandatory or advisory file locking mechanism. So these are key terms relevant to Solaris. If a lock is mandatory, then it means the process is bound to take uh, that file for uh, writing. As you can see here, that then once a process acquires an exclusive lock, exclusive locks means you just have seen, for writing the operating system will prevent any other process from accessing the locked file. Whereas the um, advisory, advisory file locking mechanism, the, the process may uh, accept the exclusive lock or reject it. It's de it depends on the process, you know. Okay, file types, you all guys know that there, uh, there are uh, source code files like shell scripts uh, in Linux or the CPP files in C. It has given a table and you guys know that from ICD or PF1 that executable files of bin or com or exe, object files are OBG or O or source code files are CPP, C, Perl, etc. Batch files, these batch files are stored by batch. Uh, actually, these batch files were used extensively. Let me show you a batch file. I'll share with you that I am still using on my computer. So this is a batch file, the manage BD lock force dismount, which I use with my BitLocker encrypted drive. When I am done working with that, I uh, call this, uh, I execute this batch file rather than writing this command into the CMD. I have written this command here and I have saved it. And whenever I double click, it automatically execute and the drive is locked. So I don't have to restart the computer to lock it again. Uh, these batch files were used extensively in the 1990s, uh, even in the conventional operating systems. And gradually their use is uh, finished when the graphical user interface has progressed a lot in these times. 
and for the operating system we do, which don't have a GUI at all, like uh, command based uh, DOS or OS slash 2 or the server operating system of Unix where people don't prefer GUI, then you do your common tasks with bad files. You write your commands into a text file and save it as static.bat file. As you can see, the name of this file is log.bat and you execute. It is not necessary that you write only one file in it. You can write hundreds and thousands of commands into these bad files. So uh, even in offices, I remember, if you have to send a badge to a certain server daily of data, like for example, in, uh, in some database organization, you have to send uh, a badge of data to the head office, then, and you are using a version of uh, Unix that don't have a GUI or even that have a GUI, then you will write all those commands into a batch file and uh, at the end of the day, you will click that batch file, dot batch file, and it will automatically uh, change the format of your data. Maybe it will zip it and it will email to the server. So you can do all tasks. And let me tell you that although uh, GDI is part of Windows kernel, directly the part of the kernel, but it works as a layer on the, on the Unix. So, uh, therefore, all commands, even all commands in Microsoft Windows that like we, I, I'm clicking the file button or new or open, anything is associated with a command. I hope you remember the PSTR, the pointer to the string. The command line, these actions are translated into commands and that commands are executed by the kernel. So this GUI is just facilitating those commands. So you may write these commands into the batch file if you like to. Also, you can write these command into your command prompt like CMD, etc. So these were the batch files. They are now used uh, slightly in user operating systems for general purpose. So there are badge files and markup files and word processor files, lib files, uh, PDF files, archives, multimedia. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just an example and the list goes on and on. Every operating system have a lot of types uh, uh, of its own. Okay, Unix in Unix operating system, it use a crude magic number stored at, at the beginning of some files to indicate their type. Um, other operating system use file types like in Microsoft Windows, you can check the type of the file by its extension. Every operating system have its own way to let you know the type of the file. So now we come to the internal file structure. Now this is logical again. All the topics we are going to study in this book, uh, chapter, a logical view that is maintained by the kernel of the data stored on the drive which are called files and the upper layer is directory and the upper layer is volume. And the last one uppermost is the so let's check file internal file structure. It is unlikely that the physical record size will exactly match the length of the desired logical record. So it's discussing the same logical records may even vary in length. So it is not necessary that uh, if there is a 512 KB sector in your hard drive that then all your files are of, of the same size. Some files will be larger than that and some text file may be even smaller than that. Therefore, uh, therefore, we use logical view and also uh, in the classical operating system there were sequential file access like on the magnetic tapes. I hope some of you have might have seen old tape recorder uh, with their grandparents which used to play the ma magnetic tapes in which if you have to play a song you have to rewind or forward uh, to reach to that particular song which means that the access is sequential you can't directly access uh, the, your desired uh, song by the just like you can do on compact disc so same was done for uh, storing files in older times and I have seen in uh, in our university uh, there was a mainframe computer in lab and it used to store its information on IBM. I don't remember the model, but they have shown us it used to store information on magnetic tape. Similarly, if you play some old movies of uh, 70s or 
early 80s, you will see that the computer storage uh, is uh, taken on magnetic tapes rather than hard drives because hard drive were a bit costly. So therefore, even in 90s, for large backup uh, uh, of uh, of the organization, uh, the small organization used to have those backups on mag magnetic tape rather than the uh, mechanical hard drives we use nowadays. Nowadays we use SSDs. I mean, uh, SSDs were not uh, common in those days, and uh, the tape, magnetic tape drives were used. And in magnetic tape drives, if you have to access some file, you have to uh, do it sequentially rather than directly. The other method is X, direct access method. In direct access method, uh, you divide your um, files by logical records or blocks. And uh, you may access uh, like block 7, block 10, block 20, block 50 of logical data directly. Uh, and uh, you can access the file without reading all the unnecessary information as it was done in the sequential access. OK, the block number provided by the user to the operating system is normally a relative block number. It is not the actual block number uh, like that is stored on the hard drive. Rather, it is a relative block number or a logical block number. That is the operating system view of blocks. For example, if your file has started on block number 10 and ended on 20, then these numbers are logical. These are not actual sector numbers of your hard drive. So therefore, these block numbers are called relative block numbers. OK, so how these relative block numbers uh, are allocated uh, is discussed in chapter 12 in the allocation problem, which we will discuss when the chapter comes. So we have started sequential method, direct method. The third one is the indexed method. In indexed method, like in your, uh, I am teaching you from the book, you have a lot of markers that you can see in the book, chapter one, two, three, four, five, etc. These are the markers or indexes. You can click any index to uh, get to the desired information. So you index your uh, records with names or with any other scheme and you can access the file through indexing system. So IBM has its own indexing system called IBM indexed sequential access method. So indexing may also be sequential or direct. It depends on the implementation from operating system to operating system. OK, gee, the next topic is directory and disk structure. Uh, which I have shown you at the start of the lecture that uh, the files are stored in directory. The directories are stored on the volume and the volume is relevant here. You can see the definition of the volume and the volume is relevant to the disk. So here you see it is figure 11.6 is showing example of an of index and direct files. So these are different records Adam, Arthur, Asher, etc. and Smith is the index. So you may access these information through this Smith. There is another index you may say uh, social security you have saved. So it becomes a relative file which contains a lot of indexes. And uh, whatever information you need, you just click the index and you will get the required information. For example, you click Smith, you will get Adam, Adam, Arthur and Asher. If you click the social security, you will get the information that is linked with this index. Similarly is the age. So we have discussed this uh, index uh, access method in the previous uh, section. So this section is about uh, directory structure, file and directory structure. So directories are stored in volume. Volume is a partition of a disk and um, each volume contains a file system must also contain information about the file in the system. So every partition may have different file system like you attach a flash drive which may have a FAT32 operating uh, file system and uh, FAT stands for file allocation table. And you have a C drive of Microsoft Windows which have NTFS new technology file system. Even on the same hard drive, you may have different uh, file systems like one drive may be partitioned as FAT32 and other may be partitioned as NTFS. So volume table of contents is basically directories what will be the table of contents of a volume there will be directories and what will be the table of contents of a directory those will be files you can see here partition a partition b or volume a volume b and every partition have directory and different files similarly 
in some operating systems, although not common nowadays, but in classic times, you may have a partition spawn on different disks, like 10 disks making a partition. Nowadays, disks are of, um, of a good size, but there were times when disks were of 10 megabytes, 20 megabyte size. Then you may need several disks for a single partition on a server system. So you may adopt uh, this uh, scheme on those systems as well, that several disks may form a partition as well. Because it's a logical representation of data, you may mold it according to your necessity in whatever fashion you like. So these are the Solaris file system example 11.8. As you can see, there are lots of files and directories and file names. Uh, as I have told you earlier that uh, in this chapter, you will find mostly Solaris and Unix examples. Similarly, it has given an example of Solaris uh, file types. Uh, there are many file types, uh, uh, file system types used in Solaris. Like we have FAT32, FAT16, and NTFS in Windows. In Solaris, you have TP, TMPFS, a temporary file system that is created in the main memory, volatile main memory. Although uh, we don't have uh, another file system in, in Windows, but in Solaris, you have a file system for main memory as well. And OBJFS for uh, virtual file system, as well as a CDFS is for virtual file system. LOFS is a loopback file system to access files. Uh, similarly, PROCFS is also a virtual file system uh, that is used for, uh, for uh, virtual storage or swapping. And UFS and ZFS are the general purpose file system used in Solaris. So there are lots of file systems uh, in Solaris it has given as an example. Okay, whatever functions you may perform on a file, you may also perform on a directory. You can see directory overview, you may search for a directory, you may create a directory or delete it or uh, list the directories in a uh, partition using search function or rename a file in a directory or traverse the file system uh, in which fashion the files are stored in a directory. You may traverse that levels. Uh, so now it discusses that how the directory structure is store, implemented in different operating system. There was a time when uh, single level directories were allowed, which means that you cannot have nested directories, a directory within a directory. You may only have a directory uh, and then you may store files. You can't have nested directories. Although this is not very common nowadays, but it used to be in few operating system. Then comes the two level directory after the single level directory. In which there was a UFD for user file directory and an MFD for master file directory. You may see in this picture that there was a master file directory. There was a directory for every user like user one to user n and every user have its own uh, directories of uh, different information like uh, any user may have its own directories. For a single uh, level directory, the writer in the textbook mentions that it is problematic for um, an operating system where users are more than one. So all four directories will be shared among the users and there will be no privacy. So to solve that problem, two level directory model was uh, implemented in which there is a UFT and a user uh, MFT. So the privacy is maintained in this user one have access to this MFT user two have access to the directory user two user three have access to directory user three in the MFT user four have access to directory user four in the MFT and every user may create the directories he choose. However, uh, they also still can't use the nested directories. So this was a two level directory structure which was adopted later on. Okay, path names. Path name is of a file by which you can access a file and uh, there are two paths which uh, the writer will discuss. One is called relative path and one is called absolute path. Relative path, for example, you have a picture abc.jpg in your my pictures. So if you write picture slash abc.jpg, then it is a relative path and if you write C users um, the name of your file, for example, John slash um, C users John slash my picture slash abc.jpg, then that is the absolute path. So path can be two. 
current directory is the directory in which you are working. So how you can store directories? You may some operating system implement the tree structures, other operating system. Uh, here you can see absolute path and relative path, which I have just defined. Some operating system you will see acyclic graphs and uh, some operating system may use mesh graphs, graphs of any type. So this is a logical view uh, in which you to access a file, you have to resolve the path. So path uh, resolution, general graph directory or mesh graph directory, you will use any sort of graphs. Uh, it depends from operating system to operating system. There should be a garbage collection or recycle bin in every file system in which you may uh, store unnecessary files which may later be unreferenced. Okay, file system mounting. I have discussed mounting when I was showing you the device manager that you can mount or dismount any partition. And I remember in uh, early Linux version like 7, 8, and 9, you have to mount a CD ROM drive to copy data from it. First, you, you insert the CD ROM, then you have to execute the command on shell of mounting the drive, and then you can copy those files. Similarly, in, I have shown you in uh, device manager i show you again that uh, you may see in the disk manager that system reserved of disk zero and this primary partition of disk one is not mounted and it is not available for a rewrite in the my computer but the other drives are mounted so you may mount or dismount drives according to your uh, requirement in any operating system i have also dismounted the bit lock drive so that it should be locked for read write. Okay, mount point. You may mount your drive at any uh, point uh, available in the directory structure, B tree structure or graph structure. You may attach it in, at any link. For example, you might have seen the network folder that is shared. You attach with your computer as a directory. As a directory in my computer, you may mount it that. So the shared folder, the shared file may be mounted at any place in your mount tree. Okay, 11.5 is the last topic and it talks about file sharing. Okay, so file sharing when you remotely share a file, uh, obviously there will be multiple users involved in sharing a file. If there is one user or one a computer system, then you won't be sharing. Also, there is every has its own owner and access rights in groups. I think uh, I should show you. Let me show in the textbook. It has given only one example of Microsoft Windows, and that is from the access rights. I'm going to show you here in this picture. So you may see that uh, every file have an owner. If you click this advanced button, it will take you to the uh, or if you click added button here you will see the owner of the owner of the file every file and every folder have a specific owner and there are groups admin groups guest groups and power users group system group which have different access rights for a file when you share a file on a network or on a multi user system you may assign You may assign different access rights for the user. So let's get back to the topic we were studying. So there is an owner of a file, and uh, I am facing network difficulty. So let me. Is giving me a message of bad network quality. So there is an owner of a file, and you may uh, assign different die to different groups. Remote file system uh, that is discussed in chapter 17 in depth, and here it is also defined uh, in which you have to use a distributed file system. You may use one method is using a distributed file system. That's a file system which is shared among different hosts or computers. World Wide Web is an example of a remote file system in which actually you are accessing files. Although your view is a bit different, like uh, you are watching 
different icons and uh, rich multimedia contents on a web page, but actually that's an icon file. That's a multimedia file. That's an image file that you are looking in your browser rather than FTP. Like in FTP, you also saw file, but maybe not that much rich. On World Wide Web, you also access files on a server, however, in a browser in a different fashion. So that's also an example of remote file system. And uh, like um, websites are for are broadcasted, any anonymous user may have, get access to that file. For a remote file sharing, we must have a client server model. The, it's a logical term as well. The server is the provider of the services and client is a user of the services. If a file is provided by the server, if a computer, then it becomes a server like time server on port 16 or World Wide Web server on port 80 listening for traffic coming. So you must have a client server model and how clients access the server is used through some sort of addressing schemes. It may be IP addresses which are very commonly and widely used nowadays on the internet world or maybe a private addressing schemes for an intranet, but addresses may be spoofed as well. So we need protection spoof. I mean changed. OK, so we have seen there are many methods of uh, file sharing. So what we call all this system is called a distributed information system. To make client server system easier to manage, we use the term distributed information system also known as distributed naming services. So here we, we will come across several uh, protocols that are used. Uh, you might be studying in computer networks and one session is not studying. So it's okay even if you are not studying. This is very simple terms like the domain name system. It's a protocol that translates ASCII addresses to uh, the network address scheme, usually IP addresses IPv4 or IPv6 because it is quite easier to remember the ASCII names. For example, if you have to access UED website, you may write UED.edu.pk rather than writing an IP address or rather than dialing a telephone number and looking from your directory. So uh, it's a DNS is a user's view where it is more compatible to users to type the location name, the address to access certain files. It was a time when a yellow page were maintained by Sun Microsystems as a translation uh, of path and information. Uh, Sun Microsystem was a very popular uh, software company and Java was owned by Sun Microsystem, but later I think it was merged in Oracle and now part of an Oracle, this software house is previously it was independent. They introduced yellow page and uh, Nowadays it is called uh, Network Information System or NIS. And the purpose is same like that of DNS is the same of NIS. Similarly, Microsoft implements Microsoft Active Directly popularly in the intranets or over internet as well, which is called Common Internet File System, CIFS, uh, in which uh, you may have file quotas at the server as well, and you, you, you may sign in even using by dummy terminals, you may sign in into the server using Active Directory structure. Similarly, um, in Oracle Solaris, it, it was uh, the LDAP was introduced, lightweight directory access protocol. Um, it is also the uh, information system, network distributed information system by which you may access file, shared files on the network. Same like Active Directory in Microsoft Windows, the LDAP in the Solaris. So every file uh, may contain metadata by which you may log the errors if there is a failure or error that may be checked through the metadata of a file uh, or through the what metadata contains they contain the state information of a file for example nowadays in microsoft word if you are working on a document and the light turns off then when you power on the computer back the word shows you the state of the file it was uh, when the light was out so you may restore that state or uh, you may again creating the file from the scratch. And so there are uh, file systems which are stateless that don't uh, save the state in which if there is an interruption, you lost your valuable information. So how the reliability of a file is maintained uh, on a shared system, shared file system, 
these are the consist consistency semantics. Semantics means rules, meanings. Um, you may, there are two methods to this, which I think it is discussing in the next 11.5.3.1 uh, and 11.5.3.2. You may ensure the consistency semantics through um, a write to open and through sessions. So let's see these. One method used in Unix is write to open file by user are visible immediately to other users to have opened this file. It means that if you open a file, the other users of that file will be informed that the token to access to write the file is with user one and you have to wait. The other method for consistency semantics, which it, it has discussed is the session semantics in which every user will be given a specific time to write into the file and the file view will be restricted from other users. The open end view file system, open AFS, apply the same consistency mechanism. So these are the examples of consistency mechanisms. This is not an exhaustive list, neither it is discussing the implementation details. It is just giving as an example as a file system interface information. OK, the other term is uh, immutable shared file semantics. As its name suggests, its meanings, a unique approach is that of immutable shared file system. Once a file declared as shared by its creator, it cannot be modified. So it is not mutable, it is immutable, that you can't share it. So like in Solaris, if you make a file immutable shared file, you can't change it later on. So um, how you can protect files, it is read only like hidden, like show, read, write, execute, append, delete, etc. These access rights are provided by every operating system and these are called access control list or ACLs. Like um, there is one owner of the and uh, owner of the group which have full permission, and there are other groups like guest group, system group, universal group, which have uh, different ACLs. So every group have its own ACLs. So it has shown uh, Unix uh, uh, ACL list, read, write, distribute, etc. Different information, and it has also shown an example of Microsoft Windows which I have shown you earlier as well. So protection may be implemented through ACLs, access control list. However, this is not the only option. Uh, there are other methods and other uh, approaches like uh, you may apply BitLocker on a drive that people with smart card or password may only access the information stored on that volume. So this was the chapter of file system interface. Uh, inshallah, we will be having an interactive session for uh, this in the coming week or uh, if the viva is finished uh, in time then we may have an interactive session tomorrow as well however it is expected that we may have the question answer interactive session next week with the contents of uh, this lecture thank you very much uh, inshallah see you next week allah office and take care